exemplifies everything about the freedom movement. And I want to welcome him up. He's a Major Jim Forsyth.
people from out of state as near as we could. And uh, we were basically told, no, we need to go knock on doors and get out the boat and make sure Ron Paul wins. But we are lucky to have at least 20 or 30 people that have been here for a long time come here with us tonight. Thank you. I know that for me, two things ignited my, reignited my passion to fight for freedom. It was Dr. Ron Paul and the Liberty Forum last year. Those two things sparked in me a desire to fight the passion for freedom. And as you can see, there's a whole group of people that have reignited that spark. Like me, Dr. Paul served in the Air Force. I got the honor, I got the privilege of reading a signed copy of Foreign Policy of Freedom from cover to cover of this. It has his house speeches from when he got in all the way up until today. And there were times I was brought to tears because of that he was the one man fighting to keep the troops safe and not misused for uh, uh, not misused for political purposes. And he was fighting. <laughs> he demanded that they actually declare war if they were going to go to war. And as I read the transcript of that, it, it was tra it's tragic how he was ignored. And we would not be in this situation if they would start that's right. Start yeah. demanding that we declare war if we're going to go to war. That's right. Because it would happen less often. It would happen less often, and for it would be more likely to be for good reasons. We have the people behind it instead of the situation we're in now. What I want to say for the people that I've been working with, I think I hope this whole thing, I hope it holds for everybody in the room. This revolution has just begun. Yeah. People here in this room will not quit until our liberties are restored, and even once they're restored, we will not rest and let them be taken back away from us. Yes. 
traveling with us this weekend is a former colleague of the U.S. Congress, and uh, many of you will uh, recognize him, and that is uh, uh, Mr. Barry Goldwater and his wife, Sylvia. <laughs>
And that's what happened with the Soviet system. But Mises was no more optimistic about our system, which is a system of interventionism, of welfareism, inflationism, and corporatism. But his fear was that it, too, would go the way of socialism. And, and, uh, but he did not predict the way of uh, typical socialism or the socialism of the Soviet Union. But what he predicted would be sort of a fascist type of socialism where corporations were in bed with government. And I am very fearful that is the direction that we're moving in. And the main reason that we have to succeed because we have to stop that movement in that direction. Now than ever before, and they can hide the ill effects for a little bit longer. But 
uh, is he still uh, new? In, in, in ancient days, they uh, uh, diluted the metal or clipped the coins, and even uh, the Chinese centuries ago used paper money. And all empires and all countries throughout history have always had inflation when they fight wars because it costs too much if you tax the people for war. So you have to have a way of doing this. They resist the taxes. Borrowing is, is limited. So countries have inevitably uh, used the inflationary process. There were some that existed. The Roman Empire, for instance, existed for longer than they deserved by stealing gold. But then they, they finally got soft, and they stopped producing, and they had their bread and circuses, no more gold to steal, and eventually their economic system collapsed because it wasn't built on a viable economic system. And that's where we are today, and we're worse off than we were in the 70s. The 60s gave us a very bad decade that gave us the 70s, and that is, <laughs> and that is that they believed at that time, and uh, there's a few of you who will remember the 60s, those were the years that I was in the military, I got drafted, and uh, it was called out. But uh, they told us, no sweat, guns and butter, no problem, but then there was a payback, and the payback was in the 70s, and that was what led to the predictable outcome that many Austrian economists predicted, and even at the even when the Bretton Woods was agreed on, individuals like Henry Hazard said, it's a non-viable system, it will break down. And it did, in 1971, that's not a very long period of time, from 45 to 71, uh, that, that it collapsed. And, uh, and, and yet it was always out based on this idea that we could create this money out of thin, thin air and uh, something had to give. But the payback in the 70s was, was tough. You know, Volcker required interest rates of 21% to restore a, a type of confidence in the dollar to further deceive the world. And uh, because we had economic strength and because we had a strong military, there was a perceived strength in our currency and it was restored. At the same time, we went through a period of time, uh, second only to the Great Depression. We had unemployment rates that were 12%, inflation rates, according even to the government, 15%, interest rates of 21%, and a, a bit of confidence was restored. But uh, today, things are much worse. I mean, the spending is much worse. The, the deficit is much worse. The foreign debt we didn't have before. Now we owe $2.7 trillion to foreigners. To even pay the interest on our national debt here at home is $1.4 billion a day. And then they wonder why people are starting to feel poor and, uh, and, and, and why young people are getting alarmed at, at what they're getting. And to keep this continual flow of spending going and, and these deficits going, we have to borrow over $800 billion every year from foreigners. And this is, this is much different than the 70s. And right now, we have seen the shift in the last couple years. The dollar's on its way down. It has been the reserve currency of the world. It's hanging by just the... Uh, just by, uh, by a thread, and uh, because we have a military power, even though the creation of new money, the money supply is key, there is a perception that is very important. If there is a perception that we will back our currency with a military might and an economic power, it will convey a certain confidence which will be eventually lost, and that's what's happening. The loss of the confidence of, of America. And uh, it's because we have done too much too far around the world. It's reflected in the dollar. So the dollar is a big symbol of what is happening in this country. And uh, there's not a sign that I see that all of a sudden this dollar is going to be restored. Last night I had the brief opportunity to present in about a minute uh, uh, to the answer to the question of why are oil prices so high? What are you going to do about it? <laughs> you know. pages of all places to find good information. <laughs> you won't find good information on foreign policy, but maybe on monetary policy, a little bit of help. But it is so dramatic of what the cost of oil did in dollar terms, and how dramatic it is that we don't, if, you're on a, if you were allowed to be on a, uh, a gold standard, oil prices wouldn't have gone up. They would have been the same as they were uh, 10 years ago. 
And uh, th this is a whole point that people have to realize that it isn't so much that inflation is occurring because somebody's being gouged, it's because of the value of the dollars going down. In certain areas, uh, prices are going up more than others. That's characteristic of inflation. Uh, nobody in the market sort of directs where the dollars will go. Sometimes they go into the NASDAQ stock. Sometimes they go into housing. <laughs> Sometimes government helps mo uh, money to go in certain directions. And uh, certainly the government has helped nudge a lot of money into the medical community, in the medical system, the drug industry, the HMOs. And lo and behold, prices have gone up and quality has gone down. And uh, this is not surprising. Uh, this is expected. But uh, if we, and I, I mentioned that last night. If we don't understand that there's an inflationary cause for the high cost of energy and to medicine, you know, we can't solve these problems. And this is why the monetary issue is so important. But in a transition, what do we do? How do we get out of this mess? We can talk, and I talk in platitudes and idealism and the Constitution all the time. But really, in politics, you do have to come down and say, what would you do and when would you do it? Are you going to wait for the collapse? Or are you going to nudge things over? Or are you going to just close down the shop? And uh, for some people, I might be going a little slower than others would like. Some might argue, well, let's just wait and we'll pick up the pieces. But I do believe that you have to make proposals. We want to get rid of the Federal Reserve. There's no doubt about that. We need to. Before <laughs> and allow gold and silver to circulate as true money. Foreign policy around the world is 
close to a trillion dollars a year. It just, the, just the war in Iraq has come up to about a trillion dollars already and growing. Uh, just yesterday or the day before, uh, Senator McCain, I think he's running for something, some office. <laughs> on the foreign policy that he likes, he thinks if it's necessary, we ought to stay in Iraq for a hundred years. And I say, no but this, so our policies have to be different. Even if uh, the people concede to that, it's not possible because that will bring us down. All the empires in. Be, not because of, of uh, because armies come and invade. We didn't need to invade the Soviet Union to have its collapse. It collapsed for, for economic reasons, and that's what will happen to us. But I say we look at this trillion dollar obligation overseas and start whittling away quickly. We can do that. We can do that by first ending the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and getting out of there. Overseas, they 
expenditures, why can't we afford better health care? Obviously, if we kept a trillion dollars and put it in the economy and put it back in your pockets, you might be able to afford your own health care. There's nothing wrong with the advice of the founders and then looking to the Constitution. There's no authority for us to police the world. The founders were very clear about what our, our foreign policy should be, and that is stay out of the entangling alliances, don't be the policeman of the world, stay out of the internal affairs of other nations. And this is not, and shouldn't have been, absolutely strange to the Republican Party, but I think the Republican Party leadership, by the way, I think they have lost their way. Yeah! Conservatism. And if the Republican Party is to exist and to thrive and to continue to grow rather than just being diminished in numbers, they have to come around to understanding these issues. They cannot reject these principles and expect to be a viable party. And even though they resist, did you notice that they don't even want me in a debate tonight? <laughs>
So the plans were laid a long time before. Uh, they didn't completely write the Patriot Act brand new. Those plans had been laid, been laid before. And uh, there were a lot. The neoconservatives did not hide from the fact that you're supposed to use opportunities. And they did see that 9-11 presented an opportunity for them to advance their cause, whether it was striking in the Middle East or further attack of our civil liberties. And this is very, very dangerous. I think we've seen some very dangerous trends, whether it's the Patriot Act, the Military Commissions Act, and all the things that have gone on. Uh, the Fourth Amendment is essentially gone, and uh, this is a, a very, very serious problem. Uh, we have virtually now legislated that we will have a national ID card. With oh, radio no. radio. Right here. So we have a, we have a, a major task, uh, Posse Comitatus, as well as the Insurrection Act, has been virtually uh, abolished. But one thing I can guarantee you, with all those laws in the book, if I am to be the president, there's nothing that says that I have to enforce unconstitutional law. Yeah.
generations have rejected these notions. And what we're trying to do in this wonderful revolution that we're revitalizing is this promotion and confidence that freedom really works. Yeah. And uh, this is the time that we can show up. This is a very important time. 
I thank you all for all the work and the effort that you put in, and I thank you today for such being such a grand audience. Thank you very much.